Hi, everyone. I see people are still streaming in. Um, I'm here to welcome you. Welcome to this, our second Montana Book, Book Festival MBF Plus event. This is an event in partnership with Fact and Fiction Books here in Missoula, Montana. My name is Lauren Korn. I am the director of the Montana Book Festival. Um, I'm really excited to um, welcome Emily M. Danforth and Carrie Shipers to this event tonight. Um, to you, our audience, um, feel free to submit any questions you have to Emily or Carrie via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, here on the back end of things, I'll be reading your questions. Um, you can use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves and you can throw some questions into the chat as well. Um, I, I will eventually probably ask you to put them into the Q&A. Um, we're gonna relegate the last 10 or so minutes of the conversation to audience Q&A. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free to use the chat and the Q&A at your leisure. Um, it's always fun to have two conversations kind of going on side by side. Um, but with that, I would like to introduce you to our authors tonight. Carrie Shipers is the author of Family Resemblances, Cause for Concern, Ordinary Morning, and her newest, Griefland. Her poems have appeared in New England Review, Prairie Schooner, The Southern Review, and other journals. Emily M. Danforth is the author of the highly acclaimed young adult novel, The Miseducation of Cameron Post. She has an MFA in fiction from the University of Montana here in Missoula and a PhD in English from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. She lives with her wife and two terrible dogs in Rhode Island. Plain Bad Heroines is her first adult novel. Welcome, Emily and Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Fact and Fiction and the Montana Book Festival for having us tonight. I'm just going to start this by saying that I, um, when I was getting logged in, I got a, a thing that said, your internet connection is unstable, <laughs> which I've never seen before. But uh, if I go out, I'll be, I'll, I'll be, Carrie will stall brilliantly. I know she will. <laughs> and I will blame it on ghosts, which seems fitting for the night. And I'll be back as soon as I can. Um, it's been pouring here all day in Rhode Island, which seems fitting for the season and um, what we're going to talk about. It's like rainy. It is the perfect rainy, gloomy October, but um, apparently my internet connection is unstable, whatever that means. So hi, Carrie. Hi, I'm impressed that only your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> I, I, did, um, I, I did not use the word only. <laughs> I did not say that, but I love that's where you went. Um, I've really been looking forward to this. And again, thanks for everyone who's tuning in and already tuned in. Um, I'm so glad to talk to you about Plain Bad Heroines, but also about your new book of poetry, which I love, Griefland, and your ghost poems. The title of that book is not Ghost Poems, but <laughs> Friends of Carrie. Uh, we routinely re uh, refer to it as ghost poems. Uh, Carrie and I talked a little bit before uh, right now, and we decided that it would be best to maybe start things um, off with very brief readings from the two of us, and then we'll get into our discussion. Um, I think reading, you know, via these platforms can be a little bit uh, cumbersome, especially from a novel, so I'll try to keep things pretty short, and Carrie, I know you've picked some, some poems, so anything else you want to tell me before I dive in? Well, I mean, I feel like if what we're doing here is starting with warning labels, right? Um, I have a terrible dog on my lap. So if I seem a little twitchy, but you're kind of used to that at this point, he's, he's napping, his blanket okay. matches my sweater. Um, we're going to do the best that later. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair but enough. I'm, I'm excited because I don't get to hear you read nearly as often as I used to. Um, mm. And I, you know, I love Plain Bad Heroines, both like um, as people, but especially your novel. Um, and this is the, your book came actually while I was teaching a class on Zoom. So I opened it for oh my God. students. Oh my gosh. To see it and like held it up for them and everything. And this is the only novel that I own, at least, that come, came with a warning label, right? <laughs> so it says danger on the spine. And then the front of it says, keep away from impressionable female readers. It does. Did you feel sufficiently warned? <laughs> it only made me want to read it more. Wonderful. I have to assume that's what people were planning. It's usually um, the I was idea. Very yeah. excited. Yeah. The marketing <laughs> team did a really great job with that band, and you had to break through it to get to the novel, which feels fitting for a bad book or a book about bad 
books. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I love that your students got to experience that with you. Um, this is Plain Bad Heroines. Uh, it's out as of last week. Um, and it's a diff it's a really challenging book to give an elevator pitch to, but I'm going to do my best. Um, and, and so here we go. Uh, half of the novel is set in 1902, roughly. Um, it's a historic half of the novel. And we're at the Brookhaunt School for Girls, which is a boarding school in coastal Rhode Island. Um, and that school seems to be in the grips of a curse. Uh, the curse may be related to a copy of Mary McLean's very real memoir, which I know some folks from Montana watching will be familiar with and Carrie and I will talk about that later. But really that historic half of the novel follows uh, a copy of the book as it passes hands and the curse that seems to follow until we end up with the two women that run the boarding school and find out more about their lives. And, and really that's the trajectory of that half of the novel. The present day half of the novel which is set you know, roughly, as I think of it as 2015, beginning of 2016, so not quite, quite present day, uh, concerns the making of a controversial queer horror film about the curse at Brookhaunts. And of course they are filming this on location at Brookhaunts. And so it's a totally different cast of characters, obviously than the section set in 1902. Um, and involves the, the writer of the book that the movie is based on and then two of the actresses that are involved in its production. Um, and we follow them as they try to make this movie that seems fraught and cursed itself. And I will tell you, I'll be the first to tell you that is sort of the most simplistic explanation of what this novel is, but it does give you some sense of the terrain that it covers and that we spend time in both worlds and move back and forth between them. Because of that, it's really challenging when doing an event like this to think about what to read because I can I really only have time to read from one section and they both have really different flavors. So to that end, I'm gonna read a section um, from very near to the beginning of the book. And just to set this up a little bit for you, um, again, it's 1902. We're at the Brookhaunt School for Girls here in rainy <laughs> coastal Rhode Island. Um, and one of the students named Clara has just been delivered back to campus by her truly awful cousin, Charles, the worst. Um, and he has driven them as he's driven her back to campus in his brand new automobile, which is new technology for the time. And also to tell you something about Charles, which he went out and bought because one of the Vanderbilts had this, this, this car. So of course, Charles had to have it too. And the other thing you need to know about Charles is that he has a pair of driving go goggles, very popular at the time. And he sort of pulled them up and he's got those on top of his head. Um, when he drops her off, he gives his cousin instructions about her future comportment at Brookhaunts. In fact, she's just been home for the weekend, essentially, to get chastised about the way she's behaving at school this semester. Uh, and she immediately disobeys him, asks her friends where her girlfriend Flo is, and then marches into the woods to try to get to the orchard to find her. Um, and Charles comes chasing after her. Instead of driving away, he comes chasing after her. And so we're going to pick up um, with Charles essentially chasing Clara as she tries to get to her young lover um, and see what happens to them. <clears throat> and so here it was, a yellow jacket nest to build your nightmares from. It's paper chambers stretching in underground layers until it was almost the size of three of Charles's cars parked in a row. And Clara's foot slipping off the edge of a mossy log landed in the uppermost layer of the nest papery frame where it promptly sank and sank up to her knee it sank, wrenching her to a stop. She would have had only moments to comprehend what had happened, why the ground had given way, because now the yellow jackets were coming furious and streaming up from the rip like a rattling chain shot into the sky. Remember that a yellow jacket is not a honeybee. A honeybee has a barbed stinger that lodges in the flesh, which means it can sting you only once before it leaves that stinger in you and dies. But a smooth stingered yellow jacket can and will sting you multiple times and thousands of vengeful, broken homed yellow jackets stinging you multiple times. Charles later said that he heard his cousin's screams, but there was simply no time to reach her. Clara was swallowed up by the swarm at once, as if she now wore a writhing mummy wrap of yellow jackets, a pulsing black and yellow outline that smothered her until she was now them. At some point, Flo must have charged toward Clara, presumably to help her, and she was at once wrapped in her own cloak of yellow jackets. 
and Charles, of course, fucking Charles, ran away, but not before pushing his now useful driving goggles over his eyes. The goggles and the running away did not prevent him from being stung, nor did they keep him from swelling with hives and passing out on the path leading back to the school, but they did help keep him alive. Later, horrible Charles would say that he'd found great purpose and meaning in the fact of his life being spared that day. By all accounts, he used that purpose to idle away his remaining days, spending his inheritance while failing at several half-hearted business ventures, and in general, behaving like the brutish, moneyed bowl of rancid bowels that he was. This behavior lasted for a period of several years until he was killed on the maiden voyage of a very big ship that met a very bad end. I'm not kidding. And no, I won't draw you like one of my French girls. Thankfully, the story is not about cousin Charles, so let us leave him to his turbid depths. Death from anaphylaxis is not known to be gentle. There were some signs in the shape of the smashed undergrowth in the piles of vomit found nearby that our strong young heroines did struggle together for a time. How long Flo and Clara clung to each other, how hard they might have worked to move beyond the yellow jackets, the nest, is impossible to ascertain and would, I'm sure, be quite difficult to put into words, even if we did know. Given the sheer number of stings each received, and so many of them to their faces, it couldn't have been long before they both succumbed to the thickening dark from which they would not wake. They were discovered very near to the place in the nest where Clara's foot had made the tear. There were so many angry yellow jackets still swarming the area, like a buzzing net draped over the whole of the thicket, that the responding Brookhaunt's faculty and soon after the Tiverton police determined that a controlled fire was the only way to get near enough to bring the girls out. Brookhaunt students later told stories of flaming yellow jackets making their way from their now burning nest through the woods and onto campus before drowning themselves, bodies hissing, in the fountain in front of Main Hall. Apparently, there were so many singed yellow jacket carcasses floating dead atop its surface the following morning that students began dipping their hands in to take them, death souvenirs. Eventually, the groundskeeper was sent to clear them with a net. Despite this carcass skimming, the water is said to have soon turned fetid and oily black algae growing along its sides and surface. So rank was this water, so unclean, that within days the school had no choice but to drain, scrub, and refill the fountain. This, like so many Brookhaunt stories, may only be the stuff of dorm room lights off legend. But then, stranger things have happened, even, especially, at Brookhaunt's. I will <laughs> end there. Um, to give you a taste of, there are many, many terrible things to come at Brookhaunt's and that just opens us up <laughs> to a few of them. Um, <laughs> and Carrie, now with that awkward transition, uh, Carrie is going to uh, read to us from her new collection, Griefland. Uh, and then also, um, you're gonna start actually, right? With um, yeah. Ordinary Morning and um, the, the ghost poems in, in, from Ordinary Mo Morning. Um, Griefland is a really, really beautiful book of poems. Uh, everyone in my house has read it and everyone in my house does not regularly read collections of poetry, I will tell you, and found it like hopeful and really, really moving. And um, it's a wonderful book. So I'm excited Carrie's gonna talk to, uh, to us some about it now. Well, you know, before I do that, can I just say, I knew what was going to happen in that scene you just read about <laughs> heroin. And I hate Charles. And I knew, I knew about the yellow jackets. Of course I did. But it's so much creepier now to me. Um, mm. and I also have a wasp nest in my garage. And I often think of you, <laughs> why wouldn't you, when they're like doing waspy things, right? Sure, I yes. I worry. Yeah. I don't have driving goggles, but maybe I <laughs> you might want to. They might be not that hard to come by. Yeah, one of the, the things that's been there's a lot of yellow jackets in the novel, um, which folks who, who read it will discover. 
they're always kind of buzzing around and up to no good. And one of the things that's been sort of fun for me and unexpected is that people have already been sharing their yellow jacket encounters with me and sort of, you know, DMing me pictures of yellow jackets and telling me that they've been stalked by yellow jackets when reading this book. So um, I wasn't expecting that, but I'm delighted to, to get the yellow jacket stories, keep them coming. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay, sorry. <It's> funny. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read a couple poems from Ordinary Morning, which are the ghost poems, as we call them for years. Um, and one of the things that I got really interested in, and I just today, actually, um, during my colleague's office hours, somebody came in and wanted to tell a version of the story, mm. which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. This is the story of the vanishing hitchhiker. Mm, um, and one of the things that has always bothered me about that story, right? It's raining and she gets picked up and then the guy comes looking for her because of course she's beautiful, of course she is. Um, and finds out that she's died. And there are like a couple of different versions of like the twist ending, if it's a photograph or he finds her grave or whatever, but she doesn't get to say very much in this mm, story, right? Mm. So I'm like, what would she have to say? Mm, so. Nice. Here we go, Vanishing Hitchhiker. I'm standing by the road in October wearing nothing white. Your foot presses the brake. The radio blinks static, switches to a station you don't know. This is the haunting you thought you wanted. If you don't stop, I'll follow you. Heels striking sparks on the center line. I'll hunker low in your back seat. Driving faster at every bridge, what you feel might be fear, but you don't stop talking for miles, telling me nothing I don't already know. You don't ask my name, where I'm from or going to. When I ask to be let out, you coast to the shoulder, shadows of fence posts and scrub oak, the loss that begins when my door clicks closed. You'll arrive home unharmed, surprisingly hungry. You'll wish we'd shared a kiss or at least a question to make your version different and more true. Already you know no one will believe you, that each telling will make it harder to believe yourself. Your doors are locked, keys waiting on the table. Hmm. And then, I mean, as long as we're meeting ghosts on the road, um, I'm gonna read this poem called State Route Y. I which is an actual road that exists um, in Southeast Missouri. It's a state highway. Um, I could not have made this up and I didn't. Well, I made some of it up, let's be honest. Let's be fair. Um, state route Y. What I thought I saw, a man walking the gravel shoulder of a road I didn't know. I pressed hard on the brake. He disappeared. I drove faster around a curve, past a cemetery that predated the highway 30 stones behind four feet of weedy chain link. It was the shadow of a mailbox, I told myself, a smear on the windshield. They say if you drive too long, you see things. I should have stopped, asked who he was and what he wanted, why he'd chosen me. Instead, I made excuses. Too far south to be a ghost of mine, he might have been a man with car trouble or bad intentions. If I'd stopped, I would have been in danger, a dark two lane, no place for curiosity or the semi that followed me for miles. What haunts me most? My failure to believe. Mm. Um, my terrible dog is wiggling. So hang on. <laughs> Sorry, he's an old man. He doesn't like to be away from me. I understand. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I will now read um, a poem from my new book, Greaseland. And the funny thing is, and Emily and I wanted to talk about this, I thought when I was writing the ghost poems that they were hilarious. I mean, mm -hmm. people sometimes were like, oh, these are dark, these are a little morbid. And I was like, no, they're so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had like really terrible things happen in my life and somehow my poems got funnier, at least <laughs> to me. So we'll see. Um, and this is a poem where the title actually reads into the first line of the poem. My dead husband never wore a watch or was ready to leave on time. He thought I should wash my car more often, hated cell phones except when he borrowed mine. Even with the window open, his showers built up so much steam the smoke detector chirped. He needed more sleep than me, 
ate food I wouldn't touch. White bread, bologna, frozen pizzas, tasting of cardboard. Although his size could make him seem intimidating, he made friends everywhere he went because he was so kind. He'd love that people talk about his jokes, how warm his smile was. He wouldn't want me to point out that sometimes he was lonely too. Loaded down with worries, he only told to me. My dead husband had amazing legs. He was great at wheel of fortune, math, and understanding puns on license plates. He never put the scissors back where they belonged. He left the lids off condiments, left mud and dirty dishes all over the house. At least twice a week, he lost his keys and temper, apologized by being silent until I gave in. Every night, he watched the local news and told me what I'd missed. He also always did the decorating. Hmm. He didn't have the greatest taste, but it was better than blank walls. He clipped coupons and read the grocery ad, kept a notebook of products I used, tampons, lotion, deodorant, so he'd buy the right brands. When I mention my dead husband in the present tense, I make myself go back and clarify. He'd prefer I use a euphemism, late, departed, past, would say it isn't nice to like when people flinch. I'm not as angry as I was right after he died, but I no longer let him vote at family meetings. Sometimes I'm jealous that he'll never have to change, reshape his life all on his own. My dead husband couldn't stand for me to be upset. No matter what the problem was, he'd swear we'd be okay, make jokes to show at least we each other. I can't imagine what he'd say right now. Hmm. that poem's amazing the whole book is fantastic and um yeah i can hear very much your humor and your voice because i know you coming through that but i think that's really interesting that people have said to you you know you had to go through all this grief that's that's explored and sort of excavated in grief land in order to like become a funny poet which i always <laughs> thought you were <laughs> Well, I always thought I was too, but that is apparently not the um, prevailing opinion, let's say. Yeah. So, so I actually, oh, yeah. go ahead. You go ahead. Well, Carrie and I first met in uh, grad school and we were sort of awkward office mates. Um, and, you know, you didn't, we didn't, get to, we didn't get to pick our office mates at that time and didn't know each other well. She was a little bit ahead of me um, in, the, in the program at the University of Nebraska. And I think you always tell it best that we didn't think we were gonna like each other necessarily. I guess mm -hmm. m my reputation preceded me in unfortunate ways. No, no, <laughs> so I was just telling Lauren about this actually before you logged on. So sorry, I was talking about you um we had met very briefly at a barbecue or something and i just felt like oh this like we're not for for each other right mm -hmm. and then yeah. because we got assigned to share that office i had a few days of like i don't think this is going to go well mm -hmm. but like we'll just be polite to each other it'll sure. be fine Mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways that I think that we did kind of hit it off is that we both got obsessed with things. They were just different things. Mm -hmm. So like, I can remember you coming in and tell, trying to tell me something about Mary McLean, although I'm sure I would not have gotten her name right at the time and Satan and lesbians and Montana. And I was very confused, but you were like way into it. So right. I was just kind of like, Oh, this is her thing, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Um, and in the meantime, like looking back, right? So I was probably babbling a lot about vanishing hitchhikers and neat things I'd seen in cemeteries. Yeah, so. yeah. So we were doing sort of the research, I feel like the way that creators, writers often do research, which is at least for me, kind of cultivating obsessions. And um, Plain Bad Heroines takes up Mary McLean's first book um, to great extent. And so I know some people watching are probably very familiar with Mary McLean, but um, I'll just give a little bit of background because it is when Carrie and I shared this office and I was sort of in my late twenties that I first discovered her um, and felt just sort of blown away that I'd never heard of her before, especially because her work really resides in areas that you would think I would have discovered her before. So um, again, I know, I know some people will be familiar with this, but um, Mary McLean, born in Canada, lived briefly in Minnesota. Her father dies when she's about eight. Um, and her mother remarries a mining man and they move to Butte. 
um, where uh, when she, she went to Butte, Butte High, uh, this is the 1890s, and was referred to as the Centerville ghost, speaking of cemeteries, uh, by some of her classmates because she was, was you know, said to sort of haunt the cemetery. She'd hang around the cemetery, the local cemetery at night. Um, and she graduates Butte High. Um, and then this remarkable thing happens. She sets out to write a memoir. She called it her portrayal. Um, and writes this book and gets it published. And in April of 1902, it's published to, you know, to say like enormous um, uh, notoriety and fame is not enough. She skyrockets essentially um, to, to fame. She's written about on front pages of newspapers across the country. The book sells 80,000 copies in its first month. Um, and it does the exact thing that she wants it to do. She sort of lifted up out of Butte and, and you know, um, gets to travel the country and work for newspapers and meet all kinds of people. She was rumored to maybe go to Radcliffe or Vassar and those things didn't pan out, but she really becomes a sensation, an overnight sensation. And so I learned about her um, and I learned about how, you know, sort of controversial she was, um, that she was bisexual, that she was outspoken, right? That, that, that she was, you know, some people likened her to sort of the Paris Hilton of her day. I learned these things about her. Cocktails were named after her, a cigar, right? was named after her, what a big deal she was. What I didn't realize um, until later was just how much I would love her book. Um, which makes sense because, of course, teen girls uh, in 1902 loved Mary McLean's book um, and, in fact, all over the country read it and took it up and some formed societies in her honor. One young woman in Chicago uh, stole a horse and when she was brought before the judge, she said she stole the horse because... Uh, she wanted to have something to write about, like Mary McLean. Um, and so I get this book, you know, wh whenever I'm, we're sharing an office together sometime in the, in the mid 2000s, and I um, uh, begin to read it, and the voice is just as fresh and funny and surprising as ever. Um, Mary McLean actually wanted the book to be titled I Await the Devil's Coming, which is about the best uh, title for a memoir ever. They changed it to the much more banal. The story of Mary McLean. It was a sensation nonetheless. And so that was this early kind of, you know, seed um, that I was thinking about and obviously reading Mary McLean and really loving her book, but not something that I intentionally knew would end up in Plain Bad Heroines until I was much further into the writing. And I sort of had, Plain Bad Heroines really started with wanting to write about a cursed horror movie. Um, and there are many of those, uh, those people who are fans of horror movies probably are familiar with like Poltergeist and The Exorcist, right? Uh, and The Omen, these movies that supposedly have haunted sets and bad things happening um, that delay production. And so I wanted to write about that. And in trying to figure out where my movie was going to be set and what it was about, I came up with this abandoned boarding school location and started researching that and thinking about that and thinking about the period that the boarding school might have been built in. And my research built that way, right? Where it just was sort of following, as you said earlier, obsession after obsession after obsession until I came up with it's Gilded Age. The students at the boarding school are obsessed with Mary McLean's book. Of course they are. Um, but those things didn't slot together, you know, for many years. And so I'm wondering, like, I know the way that I researched this book because it took me many, many years, you know, sort of eight years all told, you know, from first idea to, to seeing the book come out. But I feel like you're a very prolific writer. You, you feel very prolific to me. And I feel like you're always getting your writing done. And I'm just wondering like how you see yourself doing research. Like when you were researching the ghost poems, was it much more deliberate than that? Or how did that work? Well, I mean, I have the advantage of always getting to start over, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm complaining to you, I say is a disadvantage. Um, <laughs> but I get to do lots of, thing, lots of smaller things, mm -hmm. right? Um, so initially, I, I didn't ever mean to write a book of ghost poems, but I was trying to get out of work in one of my graduate seminars, and the assignment was we had to write eight to ten poems about the same subject, mm. and I didn't want to, and eight to ten poems about the same thing seemed like a lot of work to me. Mm. Um, so I have like two poems that kind of had like haunting connections and I was just like, oh, I'm selling these in my proposal, right? Like, I'm just going to do this because I've already got some of the work done. Mm. Um, but like, I just didn't know then, right? Like how many ghosts I would find. And there was a weird period where I've never seen a ghost. So I want to be super clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I felt like, you know, I tried to read like a stupid, um, 
like pop novel kind of that I, I just thought would be like a fun way to spend the weekend. And it had a ghost in it. So, um, <laughs> I had no idea. And so I felt like often when I'm in the middle of something, right, I become so attuned to those things. Mm-hmm. that I start to feel like they're finding me and they're probably not really maybe, yeah. I don't know. There's maybe a little magic. Zadie Smith talks about that in her essay about like, you know, writing a novel, her sort of anti-craft essay about writing a novel. And she calls that like the magical thinking period of your novel. And she says not to trust it. Cause I know that period too, where you're like, everything around me is telling me it belongs in the book. Right. And with me, I'm a writer that likes too much. So I will like, my instinct is, well, I should just put it in the book for sure. So yeah, yeah. I think that's like a, a, a period that writers, a lot of writers really know that kind of like, Oh, of course there's, a ghost in this book right so yeah mm-hmm. yeah um yeah I mean I think that like my research felt much more sort of um scattershot and then I'll I'll sort of follow it down you know one road or another and I think there's a number of things in Plain Bad Heroines that people wouldn't necessarily um realize or researched, which I sort of love. Um, you know, there's things like locations, there's um, locations in Rhode Island, there's um, the, the, the novel obviously involves a lot of Gothic play, if you couldn't kind of tell that all, already, it takes up a lot of Gothic tropes. And um, there's a location called Spite Tower, and there is an actual Spite Tower in Rhode Island, you can visit it, it's in Adamsville. Um, it, there's a great sort of very New England feuding neighbors kind of story that one neighbor built this tower in order to block the other sight lines, essentially. Um, that seems to be an apocryphal story. It really was just built for the much more sort of mundane reason of a well house and um, lodging for a chauffeur. But I took that spite tower, which just sort of sits as a structure alongside the road in Rhode Island, and I made it the tower in a house called Spite Manor um, that shows up in my novel. And there's lots of things like that, that um, they're like research that I happened upon and then became obsessed by. And I think, again, when, when novelists work or when I work at least as a sort of creative researcher, it's not just hitting the books, you know, it's sort of picking up um, sort of like a magpie or something. It's like picking up shiny things around me and figuring out how they might work in the story. Which is something I wonder about, right? Because I know that you you kind of work on a big canvas. I mean, mm. first of all, just as a novelist, but also you write big books, Emily. Mm. I don't know if anybody's ever no told you that. Said um, that. Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah, sorry to break it to you. <laughs> um, so I, I wonder, I mean, all of that research and all of those like kind of fun things, right? And you collect them, but how do you then like shape a book? Does mm. like does the book tell you? Which I'm always kind of suspicious of myself. But what was the process like for Plain Bad Heroines? You said eight years, and that yeah. seems like a long time. Yes, but you know, I mean, I was not writing every day of those eight years. I was teaching. Um, I sort of go long stretches when I feel like I'm filling the well and I'm like gathering things and I'm thinking, I'm doing a lot of thinking about what I'm writing and then, you know, intense periods of writing. So when I say that, like it's from initial idea to the book coming out, certainly wasn't writing every day of those eight years. Um, But no, I mean, I think in this book in particular, what I had to find... um, I, I got a long ways into the, the book that just told the story of the making of the present day horror movie. I mean, like, you know, again, cause I write long books, I got like several hundred pages in to that version of the book. I think you saw part of it actually. Uh, you're like, yes, I did. And I realized <laughs> that I was just becoming more and more sort of intoxicated by that research about the past. And I kept trying to sort of like stuff it into the book in ways that it didn't really fit. So I was going to have these journal entries or I was going to have letters sort of show up and none of it was really working. And I finally just sort of had to give myself permission and trust myself that I could do it because I really wasn't sure that I could. It was so different than my last book, which is just, you know, first person, one, one narrator, her story. Um, I had to trust myself that I could put those characters from the past in scene and let them live on the page and really give them their due. And that was a total renegotiation of the book I was writing. And it really stopped me in my tracks for a while. I just kind of like stopped writing um, because I I felt like I don't want to write the other version of the book I was writing, but I don't know if I can write this version of the book. And during that time that I wasn't writing, I was still reading all these things. You know, I'm reading like the ghost stories of Edith Wharton and Henry Jim, like getting more and more excited about doing this thing. I'm not sure that I can. And then finally, I, um, you know, I talked to other writers and, and gave myself permission to do it and kind of took off and did it. So there's a lot of it starting and stopping along the way. But once I figured out that the book was going to move from timelines, 
The other thing that I really had to figure out was the narrative voice. And there's this very, you might've heard a little bit in what I read, but there's this very, um, the narrator really takes you by the hand in the story. And um, you have to kind of be willing to follow along because the narrator you know, um, is your guide to kind of moving back and forth and certainly will tell you right up front has a lot of information. And once I found that voice, that kind of winking know-it-all um, voice, I felt a lot more confident about arranging the parts of the, you know, the story as I needed to. So it, it, then that took a little while too, because the book wasn't always in that voice. So yeah. What about, what about you and, and Griefland? How did that come together as a book? Well, Griefland is unusual, and I, I guess I, I should just set this up a little bit, um, and it's okay. I'm okay. Let me start with that. I'm fine. Um, in 2016, um, my father died completely unexpectedly. I just moved to Rhode Island um, and had lived there for like six weeks, and I got the call in the middle of the night, like the call everybody dreads, and had to fly home, hmm. um, and he died. And then about 10 weeks later, my husband died um, and he had been briefly ill before he died, but I had no idea he was dying until right before he actually did. Right. So um, Griefland came out of that in a way that I think I, I claimed at the time that I didn't know that was going to happen, but I think I did. Mm. Certainly everybody around me did and would tell me like, oh, this will be your next book. Mm. Um, but part of it for me is just that writing is how I make sense of things. Mm. And even if it's something that I've made up entirely, it's still kind of how I think about things. Mm. Um, and even at the worst of those moments, like there are a couple poems that I started kind of right after my dad had died, where I just felt like kind of so stunned and unmoored and I was living in this place that I didn't know very well um but I mean also like I took a lot of notes for example when my when my husband was in the hospital right like doctors would tell me things and I'd be like trying to write them down to keep track of them or like the timeline was weirdly important to me when everything was happening um and I think you know I spent a lot of time writing that book but it really only took me about two years to finish and that is the fastest. It wasn't even a full two years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I think partly is because I had so many things that I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the book where I wasted the least time. Mm -hmm. um, I There's a version of Ordinary Morning that doesn't exist that is probably three times as long as the book that I got published, right? I wrote so many more ghost poems than belonged in the book, than were good enough to be in the book. Because um, that's just like, I don't know. I like to write a lot of things. Um, and there definitely are some poems that didn't make it into grief land because they weren't quite good enough, but there weren't nearly as many. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know, and I'll probably never know if that really was like the subject matter or if it like, maybe I've gotten more discerning about my drafts. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I didn't realize, I don't think that the book, that, I mean, I knew that you were working the whole time and that you were, that you were, yes, like processing things and kind of that I really am admiring of that kind of like get back to the work um, in a time of such like personal upheaval. But I don't know that I realized that the book was that quick for you, that it came together that quickly. I mean, I was, you know, sort of here and I knew you, but I just don't think I knew that timeline. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit earlier about um, humor and sort of how you used humor. And um, yeah, I, just, I don't know if you just have like more to say about that or thinking about that sort of that using, yeah. if that was intentional or if that's the voice that the poems came out in. I mean, I think that like, I, I have a pretty dark sense of humor um, and I always have. So I don't like that didn't come with trauma. I think I was born with it. Um, there's so many things that are absurd about grief and mm -hmm. so kind of weird, right? Like I remember some of the things, um, I mean, even some of the things in my dead husband, mm -hmm. right? So like I can remember at one point, like looking around the house and being like, and I will never pick up one of your giant shoes again. <laughs> mm. Who thinks like that? But it like at the moment I felt it. Mm. Um, mm. But it so I think it's important to like be able to say those things. Yeah. Um, I think when we talk about like a book of poems that for God's sakes is called Griefland, um, it probably is helpful every once in a while to like let your readers breathe for mm -hmm. a second um, yeah. Yeah. and not, you know, feel devastating loss. 
Um, I don't know that it's so different than what you were talking about in terms of your novel, because I mean, so, you know, I can't watch horror movies, right? I'm, like I'm a big baby. I can read books, but nothing dark on the screen whatsoever. No blood, nothing. Right. Um, but your book is so funny. And I guess I just don't associate humor with um, books of horror or horror mm. films at all. I think of them as like all serious all the time. Mm. And I d and definitely that's like one style of horror that I think like some horror fans prefer, right? Like they want it kind of full out, just the scares, just the, the sort of the, the um, fear, just sort of fear driven. It all should be kind of, you know, assaulting me with fear. That has never been as a like a lifelong fan of, of um creepy things and spooky things and some forms of horror that's never really been my way into horror. I think I've always responded um, to, to, to kinds of horror stories that have elements of humor. And sometimes because they're meta, which this book very much isn't, so they're winking at conventions. There's a real self-awareness which undercuts those conventions. So like, it's that thing you just talked about, it gives the audience a chance to breathe where we're kind of like, oh, the filmmaker is very aware that this is a scary thing about to happen. So we'll take a breath and then we'll get the jump scare. But I think, you know, horror and, and comedy really are not, they really have like a lot of things that are very similar. Um, and that's why they get paired so often, right? And part of it is like excess and absurdity, both horror and comedy sort of revel in excess and absurdity, right? Like it's a similar kind of landscape. Um, I think even about like the jump scare elicits a scream, right? Where like the pratfall or the pie in the face elicits a laugh, right? But it's the same kind of like shock. Um, or even the way that like uh, uh, a horror movie might use anticipation to kind of, you know, you're, you're on the edge of your seat, you're waiting, you know, with the music and the cues or, you know, the pacing in the book that you're about to be scared and you're sort of waiting for that. Whereas um, in a comedy movie or in a, you know, like a, like a stand-up show, you, you're, out, you're like waiting for the punchline, right? Like the comedian is sort of setting up the joke and you're waiting for the punchline and it's that same kind of effect of anticipation. So I just think that, they actually are very, very similar. And I've always, you know, from like Gremlins, which is probably one of the first kind of horror comedies I saw as a kid. And I just found the other day, like my Halloween costume as a gremlin, as a, as a child in Montana, um, to, to a, a, like a movie like Beetlejuice, right? To, um, there's a slasher flick from the eighties called April Fool's Day that a lot of like diehard slasher fans don't like because it's very winking at the camera and has, I won't ruin it, although this movie is like 30 years old. So if you haven't seen it, I don't know how I'm ruining it for you, but it has, um, it has a twist at the ending and you know, there's kind of a reveal and there's, there's sort of, again, some winking at convention within it. Those have always been my favorite kinds of scares, which, which have, again, like you, there are moments of real tension and fear but there's also like a release and there's laughter and there's kind of a knowing winking quality. So I've, I've always seen those things as really um, playing well together. And it absolutely seemed like the right frame for this book. And, and also this really, this book really is a Gothic novel. I mean, I think like those are the conventions it's taking up and, and both kind of winking at, and then sometimes undercutting or sort of jabbing its finger at, you know, playing with, um, because it's a book that revels in just like too much. It has every Gothic trope you've ever heard of, right? It has like the manor house with the haunted tower that I just mentioned. It has all that atmosphere and the crashing black ocean, you know, and the, and the, the fog sort of draped over everything. Um, my joke is that it has damsels in distress, but also distressing damsels, right? So like, it's got, like, if you think of a Gothic trope, it, you know, it's pretty much in, it's pretty much in plain bad heroines, but many times it's being, it's being sort of undercut um, by the narrator who's very aware of these tropes. Yeah. yeah. Gremlins and Beetlejuice are actually two movies I have seen. Oh, um, good. Yeah, see? Yeah. Um, Gremlins scared me a lot, but I was a special <laughs> Um, I, movie making and particularly adaptation plays such a big role in yeah. playing about heroines. Yes. And I know that your first novel, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, was made into a film. And so I just wonder um, how much that process maybe um, showed up again in playing about heroines, or did you think about this idea of making a movie out of a book? Yeah, I don't think it shows up in the ways that I think like maybe people wish that it did where I could be like, yes, there's there's some juicy, you know, gossip here or something. Um, because the the writer character in the novel is kind of having a pretty miserable time with the making, right? So partly due to her own misery, 
um, she can be kind of miserable herself. She's not enjoying the process of her book being adapted. Um, and as, as I mentioned, because I was working on this book for so long, I already had sort of started that version of, of the making of a movie novel before my my first novel before campus was ever adapted, you know, optioned or adapted um, and was working my way in that. What really does show up though in the book, um, so I've always been interested in that process of adaption, I should just say adaptation. Um, but what does show up in the book and what I did learn from, from watching my book become a movie um, is a little bit about what it's like to be on set, right? So some of that, some of those details, I mean, I'd seen sets in movies. I thought that I had some idea of what it was like to be on set, but to actually be on a film set for several days and watching people shoot and interacting with the crew, that was really instructive to me to sort of see how that played out. Um, and the other thing that was really useful, and again, this was a thing that I thought I knew about movie making, but but it shows up in the book because I really learned it. Um, it's just how many people it takes to get a movie off the ground, how many people it takes to make a movie. Um, and because, you know, we're both writers, I do largely what I do alone at my computer. And then I eventually send it off to like one editor, right, to read and give notes on. And, and it's that kind of process or some friends to read early drafts of, but it's largely me alone. Um, and just watching, you know, literally hundreds of people come together to try to make one film and all the roles that they played. Um, and just thinking about everybody kind of having, working on that, that thing and having their own ideas for how to shape it and trying to exercise their control. That was all really instructive and became kind of fertile material in Plain Bad Heroines, where in those sections there, you do see a lot of people with different agendas, all kind of trying to like, do their part to make the movie they want to make. And so I don't think had I not gone through that personally, I would have had you know such a keen sense of that myself. But um, unlike Merritt, I really liked the movie adaptation of my book. So <laughs> I'm not, you know, she's, she's much crankier than I am as a character. So I think we're like maybe getting close to like the Q&A period. Carrie, I'm supposed to be watching my, my watch. I think we have a couple minutes. So do you, do you think you think we should check some of those or yeah, let's do that. I've just been talking, but there's not that many, so we can always go back. It seems like you both like to write really different topics in each of your books. Can you talk a bit about what each of you is working on or interested in, re in uh, researching now? So that's the first one. Um, I am working for the first time uh, ever with, um, so I worked collaborati collaboratively a little bit in this book with an illustrator, which I had never done before and was really interesting to me and really fun. The book has illustrations um, and, and that was really new. And I think that combined with the pandemic um, and sort of changes in everyone's routine opened me up to thinking about my writing routine differently. So I've been working with a writing partner on screenwriting um, all of which is really new to me. The screenwriting is new to me and working with a writing partner on, on, on something is new to me. Um, and that's been really, really fun and freeing, I think just because both of us don't really know what we're doing. And um, we've not, neither of us has really worked collaboratively before. And so it's been great to kind of just figure out how to do that. I think I would be miserable to work on a novel with um, because I already have a sense of how to write a novel by myself, right? And I've got like some like habits built up that I, that I wanna, um, you know, maintain. But this other form has been really wonderful to, to, to work on with somebody else. Um, and, and it's in sort of the horror, thriller, thriller paranormal sort of um, vein, although we're working in a bunch of different projects. One's a series and um, um, one's a, a film, sort of a standalone feature. So that's, yeah, that's been really fun and, and just completely new. It's a totally new kind of writing for me. What are you working on, Carrie? <laughs> well, I'm not anything nearly as exciting. Um, I was, when I first started writing Greekland, when I had reason to write Greekland, I was in the middle of what I was calling the corporate poems, mm -hmm. um, which are really poems about work, which has always interested me. Um, but these poems are, they're not always corporate. Some of them are set in academia, um, which maybe we don't need to be telling people. And I mean, I'm so interested in kind of all these weird kind of like office-y conventions mm -hmm. and language that people use and committees. I'm really obsessed with committees, even though I keep refusing to sign up for them, right? <laughs> um, so I have poems like, you know, the, um, the safety committee throws caution to the wind mm -hmm. or the sunshine committee adjusts its forecast. Nice. 
I'm just like, what are we doing? <laughs> With these committees, and, right. Right? And I'm yeah. so interested in the way we twist language. Um, mm. I have one called um, problems with playing the long game. Cause you know, I like to say long game. Um, and I'm just like, what does that mean, right? And it's so, like mm -hmm. the absurdity is sometimes of if you try to make these things literal, what yeah. would that look like? What and they're that... great fun. I yeah. love them so much. Yeah, no, they all seem really fun. Um, and it, it's interesting because I, my wife works in insurance and I am all, you know, you know this, I'm always kind of like, like I'll catch something she'll say just quickly, right? Like she'll reference some term and then I'll be like, what is that? Or like, what is that corporate speak? What does that actually mean? You know, what is that? And, and I think like, again, we get, I think people in those office jobs, you just get so used to saying it, you don't even think anymore, like what the thing means, but then an outsider kind of hears it. And yeah, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Yeah. I'm excited about those. We have another question too. Um, which is creepier, the vastness, empty spaces of Montana or the waters of Rhode Island? Um, which is creepier. Uh, well, I think if you're afraid of sharks, um, which a lot of people in my family are after recent sightings, um, then the, the waters of Rhode Island would be creepier. I like to open water swim. So that would be probably creepier. And there have been a lot of shark sightings of late. Um, but uh, I don't know, Montana can be, you know, can be pretty creepy the you know when it's dark at the right I, I don't know I don't know the answer to this question I have no idea but I think I'm gonna go with the waters I guess right just because of the presence of sharks I think I don't know Carrie do you have a thought about this you've not experienced the vastness of Montana have you I have not experienced the vastness of Montana and I do not swim in open water as well. <laughs> I like stand close to the shore um, this is actually very endearing. Emily took me to the beach once. Mm -hmm. Emily, I don't know if you remember this. Um, I do. And I had said a few times, like, I'm not a strong swimmer. And you were very unhappy with the lifeguarding situation. Mm -hmm. Not think the kid in the tower was doing his job. The beach was crowded. Yes. It was crowded. And I had said, like, oh, I'm not going in far. Like, I just want to be in the water. And I'm splashing around like a little kid in a bathtub and I stand up because I'm like, oh, it seems like maybe it's been a while. I'm having a grand time. And I look up and there's Emily standing on the shore with a towel. And I was like, oh, she really cares about my safety. <laughs> I don't remember that part of it, but I'm glad that, yeah, there's no, life. like I popped up out of the water and there you were. So. Those, those lifeguarding skills picked up in, in, at, the, at the lake in Montana have never, have never um, lost. Uh, talk about the footnotes and illustrations both add to the atmosphere of the book. Um, yeah, so the illustrations, again, uh, a writer named, uh, uh, illustrator named Sarah Lautman had contacted me about working on a project um, and, and she was not you know, working on a long project. She thought maybe like we'd <laughs> collaborate on an essay or a short story. Um, and I said, I'm working on this novel. I don't have anything like that. And I kind of put her off. And it wasn't until I got, um, you know, really sort of had given myself permission to write the novel as I wanted to with this historic half that I realized, well, this is the thing that should be illustrated, right? The, this completely fits in terms of the period boarding school novel, which were often illustrated. Um, it, it, it used to not be at all uncommon for novels for adults to be illustrated, right? We've just sort of gotten out of that habit except for, for graphic fiction, which is its own thing. Um, and so I thought, yes, that this is the thing that should be illustrated. So I wrote Sarah back and said, would you have any interest in this? This is a much bigger project. As Carrie said, it's a much longer book. Um, and she said, yeah, it was great. She was really excited and had a lot of ideas about how those illustrations should look. Um, you know, she was referencing sort of boarding school novels, illustrated boarding school novels, and also sort of early 20th century illustrators whose work she knew. And we went back and forth for a while just about style and, and the kind of look of, of the images. And I think because it's a Gothic novel, um, which is often about acts of voyeurism or lurking or characters, right, seeing things they shouldn't see and then having information about that, the whole novel is kind of set up that way. Um, the plot of the novel, the illustrations really make sense, not only in terms of feeling like an illustrated, you know, um, uh, 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 turn of the 20th century novel, but also um, 
because they're one more way of looking at these characters. And it was, it was really wonderful working um, with Sarah. She was doing some illustrations even before we had finished, I had finished writing the book. And so her way of seeing the characters or seeing some of the locations shaped even the way that I was thinking about them. And we were able to kind of talk about that. And we really wanted a map at the beginning and we weren't, you know, Sarah's like, I'm not a cartographer, right? So it like took a long time of going back and forth to figure out the map. Um, the yellow jackets, you know, sometimes there's these spot illustrations where there'll be not a full illustration, but several yellow jacket illustrations on the page. And so in this sense, this book is very much about the book as object and really the object that the publishers made with Sarah's illustrations is beautiful and feels like a period book. Like it, it, it really has that kind of feel. Um, so it all, I feel like kind of works together. Um, and then you also get to see these characters, right? Doing things and you get to see landmarks and all the fun of illustrations. Uh, as for the footnotes, I mean, I think what they do is they enhance that narrator's authority. Um, you know, we often think of footnotes. I mean, certainly there are other uh, novels with footnotes. There are a number of other horror novels with footnotes, House of Leaves being one of my favorites. Um, but, but, you know, we think of them still as belonging in like academic work largely, right? Like this has been fact-checked and, and like, here's all the, all, the, all the sources, right? Here's all the citations. Um, and so I think they lend to the narrator's authority sometimes, but then also sometimes the narrator is cracking jokes in the footnotes and winking at readers in the footnotes and really playing with this idea that like the narrator is authoritative. Um, and I think this book is, is never afraid to follow every story like down its path. And the footnotes do that too. So um, they contribute to the voice and they, they contribute to the way that the, the narrator is telling the story, I think, ultimately. I mean, it really is a series of like nested fictions and the, the footnotes are one more way to get at that. It's one more way to tell the story and, and look at the story. Okay. Um, I'm currently listening to the audiobook. I can't help but notice that the narrator has a similar voice intonation to me. Did you have any input on who read the audiobook? I did. Um, yeah, I got to, I, um, that's interesting. I didn't, I, uh, yeah, I didn't know. I, I guess I didn't notice that myself, but you can never hear, like, like, you know, nobody likes the way that they, they speak. And so, and I really like the way that the audiobook reader speaks. I did get to listen to several different, um, suggested sort of audiobook readers and, and um, yeah, we landed on on Z Sands, and I think yeah, I think I yeah, I haven't listened to the whole thing, but what I, I listened to, I got to listen to some of it. I think it's it's a it's a difficult book, I think, to figure out how because of those footnotes and those other elements to figure out how to translate to audio. And I think they did a, a bang up job. So yeah, it's, it's been interesting to hear from readers who are experiencing the book for the first time via audio. But I hadn't thought about sounding like that narrator necessarily. Um, and I'll have to go like listen and see if I think I do. Um, Jeremy asks us, Carrie, if you collaborated with one another, what genre would you choose? And what's a one sentence pitch? Oh, I love that. Do you think you could collaborate with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, we, we cannot answer your question. Carrie just definitively said no. I think that like, there's no way that I could write a poem with you. I don't think ever, but I do feel like, you know, you don't think we could collaborate on a novel? I know you have a secret novel inside you that you kind of want to write, like a cozy oh, mystery. I do. I'm always an Agatha Christie. You um, are always threatening to write a novel. Yes. Yeah, it hasn't <laughs> happened yet. Um, I think that we could have a podcast. I think oh. I'm, I'm coming down to. I think that we could have a podcast. What would we would talk about? What's our pitch? Fun. Um. Yeah, I need to work on that. We could talk about okay. terrible dogs. Um, <laughs> We could talk Terrible about dogs murders. of Rhode Island. We, There's we, a lot of those. There's too many. I know. The like competition is going to be tough. So we're going to have to find our own way <laughs> in. Um, I don't know. I think we could think of something. Yeah, I'm sure we could. It's a great question. I don't know. Carrie, I mean, you. I think Carrie's first answer is the most honest answer and you should go with it. Which is, <laughs> he will never collaborate with me ever. Um, for Emily, have you heard of the killer hornets the internet is talking about? And does it make you feel at all prophetic? What should we do? I love that. I have. And when the book, when we were like, the book was in galleys this summer, everybody was like the year of the murder hornets, right? And then they never seemed to quite um, come to fruition. It, thankfully, we've had, I think, enough on our plates in 2020. We didn't really need the murder hornet invasion. That I mean, I know that they're, I think they're still here technically, but it seems like they fell out of the news cycle at any rate. I haven't heard a lot about them. Um, yeah, I don't know that I feel prophetic, but it was kind of, um, it was, it was, 
my my publishing team was certainly amused early on. They were like, oh, the murder, right? This is going to tie in really, really well. And I think because the book is so meta um, and there's so much winking and there's so many real things drawn from life and put into the book, it just feels like one more thing that like, of course, this would be the year of the murder hornets, right? Like, of course, you know, like somebody already asked me if I thought that maybe I'd made up Mary McLean and said that they were on her Wikipedia page, but was wondering if like, maybe that was an elaborate scheme of the publisher. And so, you know, like, of course, maybe, you know, I'm like, no, we don't have those resources. And Mary McLean was very real. And I think she would want you to know she was very real. Um, but the murder hoarders just feel like one more kind of, I don't know, winking. It's that thing we were talking about, the magical thinking of the thing you're working on. So I don't have any advice about how to avoid them, though. I've just been enjoying people sending me their pictures of like hornets nests in their, in their grills that they can't use anymore. So <laughs> I have gotten a lot of stories about people's wasp encounters. Um, I think we are out of time. This was, thank you, you know, it, it's always like abrupt, but I appreciate the questions and my internet did not cut out. And thank you for doing this with me, Carrie. It's funny, like we live in Rhode Island, but we don't get to see each other ever, so. We never see each other. And this was so fun. It's the most FaceTime we've had. I hope Sandbag is okay. I know there was an incident for a moment. Um, Thank you. I don't know if like, but yeah, okay. Hi, hi, Lauren. <laughs> I always like, just are we waiting? <laughs> hello. Hi, that was really wonderful. Thank you, um, Emily and Carrie, for being with us here tonight. Um, congratulations on your books, Griefland, Plain Bad Heroines, um, and thank you to everyone watching and participating with your conversation in the chat and with your questions. Um, just as a reminder, you can purchase Griefland and Plain Bad Heroines online at factandfictionbooks.com. Um, I also urge you to go to the Montana Book Festival website, montanabookfestival.com, um, and donate there so that we can continue programming like this one um, into the future. Uh, next month, we have an event with father and son author duo, Carl Smith and Jeremy N. Smith. So um, look out for some marketing on that. And I also have um, one extra thing here to tell our audience. I have an extra galley oh. of this yes. wonderful book. Um, and I'm going to say that whomever uh, emails me at montanabookfestival at gmail.com, all spelled out, montanabookfestival at gmail.com. Whoever emails me first, I will send them this copy. Oh, nice. So um, audience members who are still around, I see there's, there's plenty of you there. If you haven't yet read this, um, get on it. Email me at montanabookfestival at gmail.com and I will send you this copy. So Wonderful. Um, with that, thank you again, Carrie. Thank you again, Emily. Congratulations. Um, I hope you are both coping well and uh, staying safe. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Have a great night. Bye, all. <laughs>